So dopamine really is like pleasure, reward, motivation, anticipation. Okay. So that's D in the dose. Mm. So yeah. O is for oxytocin. What is that? Oxytocin is magical. I think it's the neurotransmitter or hormone. They could be considered as both that is most slept on in the modern world. I don't think it gets talked about enough. And I think it's arguably the neurotransmitter we're looking for most as a species, but we're getting confused and thinking that dopamine is what we're trying to attain. To take you on that journey, from a biochemical point of view, oxytocin enables us to experience the emotion of love. Love is a very complicated topic. You could look at it down a lot of different lens, lenses. But from a neuroscientific perspective, oxytocin is enabling us to receive love, to give love, to experience the love of things. Like even if you're literally walking in nature thinking, I love that sunset, you're generating oxytocin. And it's a chemical that's very calming for us. It's very present focus. It's very fulfilling. And in our obsession with dopamine, we now are sacrificing oxytocin. When we lie in bed, for example, we sit on the sofa next to our partner and we scroll our phones instead of interacting with them. We choose dopamine over oxytocin in that moment. And dopamine is wired within us to never actually fully satisfy us so that our ancestors always wanted to make better fires, build better shelters, make better tools. It's not designed to fill you up. That's why no dopamine path ever fills you up. Even the healthy dopamine stuff, like progressing in your career and creating cool things, you don't have a moment where you think, I'm satisfied now. Your brain just constantly wants to keep evolving and keep progressing. Oxytocin is the opposite. There are moments where you hang out, for example, with maybe your own kid. I haven't experienced that yet, but I've hung out with lots of my family's kids. And you hang out with a kid and you're really present and you're engaged and you actually feel full. You're like, wow, this is just magic right now. I don't need loads more of it. This is just pure magic. And in this nature of reality we're currently in where we're sacrificing oxytocin, we're therefore feeling more unfulfilled. Our nervous systems are much more restless. Our brains are much more anxious. And if we can learn to reprioritize the oxytocin, it's incredibly impactful on our experience of life. Wow, that's such a profound insight that oxytocin is what we need, but dopamine is what we're getting. Dopamine is such a powerful force, but oxytocin is really like this love bonding, this connection that we, we're desperately craving. That's what we need, but mm -hmm. the more powerful, immediate thing is like this dopamine that's just dropped in front of us. It's just so potent and electrifying that... It, it, it seems to take, you know, our brain seems to be wired to focus on the dopamine thing and put the connection and the human love bonding to the side. And it's so interesting because I, I love watching shows about hunter gatherers just because I'm interested in this evolutionary journey. And they, of course, are looking for dopamine a lot too. So they'll wake up in the morning and the men maybe in the tribe that are going out hunting will begin to consider how they're going to approach that. The women might be making fires or going foraging or building tools or maybe also contributing to the hunting. And in the daytime, there is this pursuit of dopamine with all of them. But in that time, they have fun, but they're just in a very deep state of concentration. But all of that concentration leads up to the evening where they have the fire with the food and they dance and they sing and they love and they laugh and they connect. And it's almost like dopamine is a precursor for their capacity to experience what they truly want, which is eating the food and loving one another and being connected and being safe. In the modern world, we're basically just waking up dopamine on our phones, do dopamine all day on our computers. And then in the evening, we go back to dopamine again on the phones. And we've just forgotten that dopamine originally was so we could access love. And now dopamine is just a portal to access more dopamine. And that's why I think our being, like our deeper soul, our spirit is so unsatisfied because it's not actually accessing the thing it deeply wants. And there are many scenarios with this dopamine oxytocin trade-off where addictions in our modern world are unmet oxytocin needs. So say, for example, pornography addiction. I myself grew up and I engaged with pornography super young, just like everyone did, and then had to go through the process of like, how do I actually let go of pornography addiction? And when I began really exploring this, you consider 
pornography is very much pure dopamine, whereas intimacy with a human being would more be oxytocin. So therefore, a pornography addiction may actually be partly fueled by a lack of need in the intimacy component of your life. If you were to look down a different lens, our addiction to social media and constantly scrolling and looking at other people having fun and laughing and living their lives might be an unmet need of deep, fun social experiences with people. Our addiction to work, for example, and money might be an unmet need of feeling safe, feeling recognized for the work we do. So there's many opportunities where you think, if I could satisfy oxytocin, maybe my dopamine addictions could reduce. Wow, you're, you're really sending off a lot of light bulbs in my mind right now. So dopamine is really connected to survival. And, and once we have those survival needs met, then we can focus more on oxytocin, which is the bonding. But, you know, you can't really do the bonding if you're in a state of danger. You know, that's what mm. happens when you're in a, in a safe zone. And it, you reminded me of uh, the theories from Dr. Gabor Mate. I don't mm, know if you're yeah, familiar with him, but he, he yeah. talks a lot about childhood trauma and how that leads to mm -hmm. addiction. And you're, you're kind of making that connection for me now. I'm like, okay, how, how exactly is childhood trauma connected to addiction later? Like what's going on in the brain there? But it seems like these children who had a very traumatic childhood didn't get that proper oxytocin bonding. And then later mm -hmm. on in life, they are chasing this dopamine or these other hot, they're, ch they're chasing that feeling later in life through substances. Definitely. And the feeling that we're safe is a feeling that enables oxytocin to become the priority. But if you're feeling unsafe, your brain is going to stay more alert in dopamine land. Dopamine isn't a calming experience. We might be fooled into thinking that doom scrolling our phone is calming us in the evening. But in reality, when you were to measure the brain, we're just staying in beta brain waves, we're staying in dopamine, we're staying in sympathetic nervous system. We're not actually calming down. In the same way that alcohol fools us, that it's calming us down, but it's not actually calming us down at all. It's just adding GABA into the brain and kind of fake calming us down. And it's really important to consider this in your day to day life. Am I intentionally activating the experience of love to calm my addictive nature of my brain? Because for a period of time, I think there was a percentage of society that had quite addictive brains by nature, and they may have struggled with the sugar and alcohol a little bit more. But I think with the advent of the phone and social media, almost the whole of society is moving towards a more addictive functioning brain because of the immediacy of the uh, dopamine access we have. Yeah, it's it's become just so socially acceptable to be addicted to your phone. Like you go into a mm -hmm. an airport or um, anywhere, a train station, yeah. every single person's on their phone. And that's just kind of what you do. If you're the one person not on your phone, you feel like uh, you feel this almost like this angst that you need to just take it out and join the, the herd. I know. And isn't that wild? Like I... Uh... There's this phrase, uh, raw dogging, where you attempt to do like a flight without your phone or whatever it might be. I mean, raw dogging probably has a quite a variety of meanings, but there's a social media trend where you try and take like a seven hour flight, for example, and you're not allowed to use the screen in front of you, you're not allowed to go on your phone, you've got to try and sit there and raw dog. And uh, I've been testing this in a variety of scenarios when I go on like long car journeys I'll see if I can do no music, no podcast, no phone and just be in the quiet. Or for example, I'll leave my house with my credit card so I have money and I'll go out to get like a coffee and go to a bookshop and go to a, a supermarket to buy my lunch or whatever it might be. But I will leave the phone at home. So I'm forced into lots of moments where I have to sit and be bored and I'll kind of get my, I don't even drink coffee anymore, but get whatever I do get, match or something like that and sit there and just be bored. And it's almost counterculture now to sit and have a coffee and not be on a phone which is just so crazy that that's our world but i personally believe based on all this analysis and research into brain chemistry that moving towards these slow states is exactly what our brain needs that's very good i think people are waking up to it i'm i'm hopeful i've met some young people that have surprised me that Cool. weren't on their phones. You know, I, I kind of assumed that all young people were just addicted to their phones 24 seven and like very socially awkward. But I have met a few young people that completely changed my perception. They, they That's didn't have cool. phones. They, they thought that social media was the worst. And so that kind of restored my hope in some way. I, I hope more there's like a movement of younger people to just get offline and, and meet in the real world. Yeah, it's definitely... 
there's a changing tide. I think the percentages obviously are still more towards spending time on the phone, but there is a changing time. There's a lot of teenagers wanting to get dumb phones and actually hang out with each other. And I train a huge amount of schools in the local area here. All the kids go through this dose uh, process and there's loads of kids out in the skate park, out in the nature. We do this thing called forts with friends where the younger kids, kind of 10 to 13 year olds, have to go into the local forest and build forts like they're actually hunter gatherers. And the forest is absolutely covered in them. So there are kids that want to do other things for sure, kids and teenagers. Yeah, I just uh, got hired to do photography for this event where the kids were, high school kids were dissecting pig brains. They were, um, <laughs> it was a really cool event and I'd had to take photos of it. And I was really impressed by none of the kids took out their phone and filmed anything. They were all okay. super engaged. They were laughing. They were very polite and having fun. So, you know, a couple of experiences have changed my perception on uh, this younger generation. You know, maybe they are more focused on being present. You know, there is hope. There is some light at the end of the tunnel. And I sometimes think the generation that experiences maybe the most intense what intense experience one side is almost going to be the generation that births the other side but the whole reason i'm technically obviously a little bit older than that generation but i still had an iphone from 11 years old so to me my whole world has been inside an iphone and i think that younger generation is going to birth a new paradigm which is cool and i think the more we focus on the good and what they're heading towards rather than talking about the problem the more we're going to manifest that into reality anyway yeah, I feel very lucky because I didn't get a smartphone till I was in my late 20s. And yeah, uh, that the is a little different. The crazy thing is my my career is like online now. And I didn't yeah. get I didn't get on this stuff until I was in my mid to late 20s. Uh mm -hmm. didn't really have social media in high school or college, and I feel very fortunate to have grown up in a time before the madness. <laughs> but uh you know, I can't even imagine that. For me, how I grew up, being at college or university or something without social media, that just seems crazy. It seems like some kind of nostalgic movie I could create in my mind where everyone's kind of hanging out and talking. And it seems like a cool, cool world. Maybe that world's going to kind of return in a new way. Yeah, for some reason on my uh, social media, I keep getting these uh, very old nostalgic videos of yeah. high school in 2001, last day of high school, and somebody brings a camcorder into high school, and everybody just seems so like mentally healthy and present. Mm -hmm. You know, when the camera goes on them, they're they're waving and they're like, "Hey, what's up?" and nobody cares about their brand or where's this video yeah. going to end up? You know, like that thought and doesn't even cross their mind. A little bit more free. And dopamine not all dopamine, but the quick sort of dopamine by nature ever so slightly imprisons us in many ways. For example, I, I really struggled with cannabis for a long time. And I, whilst I kind of convinced myself for a long period of time, I was so good for my creativity and all these different things. I was slightly in the prison of cannabis where I was constantly having to think about it and measure out when I was going to interact with it. And I it did feel as I became, as I came away from it, almost like I was escaping some kind of prison. And I think whether it's the nature of social media that's made us more conscious of our behavior. So if we be worried about that and that nostalgic example, you said that wasn't the case or whether it's different addictions like the alcohol, whatever it might be, it kind of, it doesn't allow us to be truly free as a human being. And in that video we made, the whole idea was that their souls are either free or they're not free. And I can't think of many humans that wouldn't want to be on the path of pursuing more freedom. It's a pretty nice feeling. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from Terrence McKenna is uh, he says, if you don't have a plan, you become a part of somebody else's plan. Oh, interesting. Which, you know, right now it feels like once you go on your phone, you feel like a rat in a maze. You know, you're, I know. You're very, I'm very aware of that. There's an algorithm that's just kind of playing puppeteer with my brain. I know. And it's so good, even with my awareness and study into it it still can get me. And then I'm like, wow, it literally got me. It's just like in control of my mind. And I put the phone down, lock the apps and just like get away from it. <laughs>